I send greetings to all those who are a part of this event. My name is Keith McMullen. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Deseret Management Corporation, a multi-based, a media-based organization that has operations in the arenas of news and commentary, publishing, and entertainment. Our platforms span the digital, print, and broadcast worlds. Deseret, Deseret Management Corporation believes that a robust, active, and faith-filled media sector is vital to progress on issues. Journalists and experts from our organizations are participating in today's dialogues. Our aim is to lock arms with others in bringing light, truth, and compassionate service to global conversations and to personal behavior. It is my pleasure to introduce Sharon Eubank for this keynote session. She is a faith leader, a truth speaker, and a person of immense compassion. Sharon is a leader in the Relief Society organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Relief Society is one of the oldest and largest women's organizations in the world, embracing over 7.2 million members in 187 countries. Ms. Eubank is also the president of Latter-day Saint Charities, the humanitarian organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that provides emergency relief and long-term humanitarian assistance in 202 countries without regard to race, religion, ethnic origin, or political affiliation. She is also the executive director of Just Serve, a global, free, nonprofit platform that links volunteers with local community needs through an easy to use mobile application or app. This app is active in five languages, 13 countries, and its partnerships include global NGOs, national and state governments, and faith-based organizations. A commitment to the two great commandments, to love the Lord and God and to love our neighbor, provides the foundation for individual happiness and peaceful growth in families and societies, locally as well as abroad. Our hope is to learn from Ms. Eubank what she is uniquely qualified to share. The organizers of Horasis have asked that she address the vital role of leadership in an era of humanitarian crisis, the role of communities of faith. Each of us knows how the COVID pandemic, armed conflict and other such events affect people at every level of human need. The suffering in Ukraine places this front and center. People become disillusioned, faith is shaken, and hope dwindles, often leading to despair. I know Ms. Eubank personally. She and her associates, past and present, have successfully grappled with these issues for 180 years. Whether a journalist, a leader in society, an NGO expert, or a business executive, we can all learn something from this session for the issues pertain to each of us. We thank you, Mitch Eubank, for being with us today. Thank you so much, Keith. That's a very kind introduction, and I really welcome the dialogue that's taking place today. I also want to thank the Horasis community that's gathered around the world for this important forum. I think we're connected through technology, but we're also connected through our relationships. And I hope that today's discussion is going to reinforce how true that really is. And we can emphasize that we share quite a bit of, of common ground, even in the differences that we have. I uh, wanted to welcome everyone to this important panel. It's called Leadership in an Era of Humanitarian Crisis. Uh, it's the role of communities of faith. Uh, we're pleased and honored to be part of this important Horasis global event. Uh, I am Abe Nijad. I'm the publisher of a company called the Network Media Group. I will moderate this panel. Um, and I'm glad that Keith uh, had a chance to introduce uh, Sister uh, Sharon Eubank. And of course, we'll be talking to her in just a moment. Um, Sister Sharon Eubank, uh, sorry to cut you off there earlier. Did you want to say something before we get into these lines of questions that we'd like to ask you? Well, as I said before, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. And, and this is the second time that representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have participated in the Horasis event. And I'm really glad that that uh, faith groups have a seat at this table. And as I think about ways to address uh, leadership in an era of humanitarian crisis, I just want, want to maybe hit something that I mentioned in the, in the questions. 
When disasters or emergencies strike, our natural reaction is to think about distributing physical goods. And we have lots of experience in that, but there are always unseen emotional and spiritual needs that are often neglected. And I think it was David Brooks, uh, who's the opinion writer in the New York Times, but he was, he was writing recently about our social fabric is fraying and you see it in irresponsible driving and arguments breaking out and uh, public meetings and family dinners become untenable and there's a lot of substance abuse rates that are increasing. And, all of this is happening at the same time that charitable giving and participation in civic uh, society is declining. And so he makes a connection between those two things. And then he says, there must be some spiritual or moral problem at the core of this. And so I think that it's, it's critical to prepare for disasters and, and uh, there are some foundational principles. I don't know how much time we have. Can I keep going or are we good? Absolutely, we, have, we do have time, so please go okay. ahead. As I think about ways to address issues like equality and community and dignity and belonging, there are some foundational principles that, that, uh, that lead to a holistic approach. And they're not just for humanitarian work. Uh, they're, key, they're the key to progress to every part of society. But let me just talk about three principles that have been so important in my own humanitarian career. The first one is choice. It's self-determination. I wish I could show you a photo of a it's a, it's a picture of a winter clothing distribution taking place in northern Iraq. So Latter-day Saint Charities has bought the clothing in Turkey over the border and they're bringing it now to the Yazidi populations in bitter cold winter. They open up the bales and a young girl, probably 11 years old, goes over to one of those bales and she picks a coat. The coat she picks is the most impractical coat there. It's pink, fake fur that isn't going to keep her that warm, but she has just been drawn to it. And instead of saying, no, 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 that's not what you want. We want to put you in this down zip up parka. The ability for her to choose has been taken away from her in so many ways. She can't pick what she eats, where she lives, how she worships, who she's with. And a small thing, even like a coat and protecting her ability to choose that is one way of restoring the dignity and the ability for self-determination that has been ripped away in a disaster. So being free to choose, being free to make a mistake, being free to recover, change your mind, and then allowing other people that same freedom, that's a foundational principle for any positive human interaction. And it often in a disaster will get truncated. And, and one of our great desires is to bring that ability back for people. So that would be the first principle. The second principle is of dignity and meaningful work. And it's very easy to just want to distribute things to people without recognizing they are hurting spiritually. And I'll, I'll just give an example. It also comes uh, from Northern Iraq. When Mosul was liberated, liberated from its ISIS, uh, the, the, the ISIS who had taken it over, when they left, they, they smashed every facility. They cut every wire. They didn't want it to be easy for people to come back. Well, there was a Chaldean priest uh, there. He wanted to bring his, his congregations back, but they had to have school. It wouldn't work if they didn't have school. So he cleaned up his church the best he could. And then he approached Latter-day Saint Charities and asked, can you help us get school furnishings, knowing that that would be critical? Latter-day Saint Charities staff, they know these principles about dignity and, and uh, meaningful work. And so they said, absolutely, we're going to help. But could these families, could they make the desks rather than ordering them and bringing them in? And he said, you know, these are, these are accountants. These are dentists. These are not people who are used to this kind of work. And they said, well, we'll bring in some experts and, and try that. And he said, all right, they're willing to try. So here you have these, these middle-aged fathers who have never picked up a, a power tool before, but they're welding the frames and they put the wood on the top. And at the end, when those polished desks were finished, and their little children were sitting in them and they're standing at the back, they are filled with pride. They're filled with, I did this, I provided, I'm not a failure, I provided this for my family. And if we can get together as a community to build desks, what else can we do? So that, that removal of the skepticism and that empowerment of meaningful work is, it's a great healer in these, in these situations and, and I've seen some of the most moving responses to humanitarian work in that way. So mm -hmm. meaningful work. Finally, I would just say that cooperation is a unifier. 
there are some activities that just by their very nature require cooperation. Sports is one of them. You can't have any fun unless everybody agrees to a certain set of rules. Music is another one. You're not going to get the product that you want unless you can cooperate. And I've seen, I've seen Africans on a football pitch in Italy put aside all their tribal and religious differences and go full bore for two hours because it's sporting is, is sport is such a unifying uh, factor. But one thing that we have not used to its full potential is voluntary service. Volunteering in your community and doing something that doesn't benefit you in any way, but it's good for the group is very powerful as you work shoulder to shoulder with people that you may have never had any interaction with and maybe wouldn't want to, but you're doing something for your community. And I think that weaves the social fabric back together when it has frayed. So I guess my point is that people are the heart of the solution. I think these examples, they just say, it's not goods and services that make the difference. It's that is sustainable. It's it's building trust and respect and understanding. And that just takes time. It just takes, it, it takes effort to be able to do that. And uh, they remind us that we're all children of the same God and faith communities are perfectly positioned to do this because we're very good at trying to make uh, humanity come together and achieve a lar larger goal. So if I could give a call to action, I would just I would call on governments and policymakers to realize that many of their objectives can be achieved more effectively if faith communities become part of the solution. And the good that religion can do, especially when it comes to integrating and achieving sustainable development, is amplified when religions work together along with governments and non-government organizations. And there may be some who say religion breeds conflict, but I would say to them, that um, it will take authentic religion to, to approach ra radical problems. And authentic Islam will be much better at, at combating some of the elements that may be destructive. Authentic Christianity will be better at, at reaching toward r radical elements of that. Uh, th this, this is the opportunity that we have. Faith is actually the answer. And, and I would, uh, I would call on media to balance their reporting, to respect the roles that are uniquely played by religion and faith in society and, and share stories of goodness and humanity and faith in God and cooperation. And I'd invite every person listening, commit yourself to living the great uh, two great commandments, love your God and love your neighbor with all your hearts. And uh, I really believe that as we work on those things, even in the midst of a lot of conflict and a lot of disaster, we will find new heights that we can uh, go, we can share the road with others, and we can find great joy. Thank you very much for having me today. Absolutely. So Sharon, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions regarding your remarks today, um, and perhaps about the seismic shift in some of the current events that we're experiencing. Uh, you spoke about various aspects of humanitarian work that sometimes go really unnoticed by the media. So what aspects of the work have you witnessed um, that you would really consider untold stories of the humanitarian reality really worldwide? That's such a great question. And I think uh, Ukraine and other things going around the world are, are really uh, putting that in our mind. Many years ago, I heard a British scholar, his name was Dr. Richard Benda, and he was speaking about uh, the, the role of agency in religion in political violence. And he told the story about genocide in his home country of Rwanda. And when, they, when the genocide finished and they prosecuted by law the war criminals, and then their sentences were passed down and they were to be executed. And there was this feeling in the country of, we're gonna get resolution out of this. And you know, people gathered. And when those first executions took place, there was, a, there was a sickness that sort of accompanied that. And they didn't have the resolution that they wanted. And they recognized, this is just perpetuating the cycle of violence. And so the Rwandan society recognized they needed a way to to somehow talk about repentance and redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness, they turned to the Catholic Church and asked them to propose a process that the whole community could kind of go through to reconcile. And it was very powerful to hear him speak about how that was what was, became more important than the justice they thought that they needed. So from my own faith perspective, my faith was driven out of the state of Missouri by an extermination order. And yet just last week, 
uh, representatives from Just Serve met with the new Missouri governor 182 years later, and he was praising the work of the church. And I just, I re recognize that this kind of example is needed. We often tell blow by blow what's happening with the violence, but we never come back around and tell the story of healing, healing from what has happened to us and how do communities heal. And so I would love to see more stories about when the violence stops, how do we recover? And that, I, to me, that's the more interesting constructive story that could be told. Mm, that's interesting. I wanted to get into something else that's quite interesting, again, on a global level. And I know you have a lot to say about this. So the COVID emergency has really forever changed the way that health commodities and services are delivered, as we all know. So how has COVID really changed the way that the humanitarian work of the church really views the best way to assist on global health programs? <laughs> Probably everybody is revamping in the face of the pandemic. It changed so much about what we do, and particularly humanitarian. I could probably mention three things. One of them, like everybody else, COVID really accelerated our use of technology. So everything from telemedicine to rapid testing to the way researchers consult with each other, uh, how we find the, the needs in very remote locations that we can't visit. Uh, it was a great boon, but it also sped up the spread of disinformation and false narrative, and we know about that too. So the church is using technology and its communication channels to try to disseminate trusted information when there's a lot of confusion. But I think we also have to be aware that's positive, but there are communities that do not have access to technology. So we've got to be aware of that technology divide. And even though uh, we're, we're moving forward in a, in a very interesting way with technology, there are still people that are not being served in that way. So that's one thing. A second thing would be supply chains that got you know, disintegrated and early in the pandemic. They're just, we, we recognize we need redundancy in our supply chains, and we did not have that before. So there's a partnership uh, here in my hometown between the local university and the local healthcare system, and they provided medical grade plans for us to provide gowns, masks, uh, face shields, and, and we built them ourselves because there was no supply chain. And, and so we've got to come up with creative plan Bs that provide some redundancy. Um. And, Maybe the last one would be, I mean, I feel most strongly about this one. It's the best healthcare interventions don't matter if the people don't take advantage of them. And so it isn't going to be constructive if you just call out certain opinions as being ignorant or evil. People have valid reasons for, the, for holding the opinions that they do. So change is only going to come through listening and respect and resolving concerns and patience. And that may be the biggest lesson that we've learned over the pandemic time. Wow. Sharon, uh, last year you spoke at an interfaith forum in Italy and addressed the need for faith groups to collaborate. So in today's environment, do you see more or less of that taking place and what can really be done to catalyze faith groups to harmonize or leverage their efforts in a global development arena? Abe, thank you for asking that because, frankly, I see more collaboration taking place now than any time in the 25 years that I've been working in this industry. And some of it's being driven by need. There are so many crises that are uh, happening all at once that we just need new actors. We need new people, new resources that have not been engaged before. And governments and multilateral agencies, they recognize the role that the faith-based organizations and the faith community can play. And they're tapping into a long tradition of work, but we've never, we rarely collaborate in this way. So I think they can, they can expand what is possible, but it's important to recognize the faith-based communities have certain skills. They're right on the ground, they're grassroots, they speak the language, they know the culture, they're trusted voices, but these big multilateral organizations, they play a role too. They, they gather small impact to, to aggregate for something big. They can cross international borders. They can get into war zones when nobody else can. They can, they can negotiate prices. So it's, it's the recognizing of the strengths of each player and then leveraging that in cooperation. And truthfully, it's never really been done very well before. We are at the cusp of something brand new. So, uh, Sharon, as you know, there's a global emergency really taking place even as we speak. Um, I understand that it may be somewhat delicate for an organization such as yours to address the situation in Ukraine uh, at this stage anyway. 
But what can you tell us about the humanitarian work really underway in that part of the world at present? You know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is like many other faith groups. We have members in all the countries affected. We have members in Russia who are feeling the difficult effects of sanctions. We have members in Poland and Germany and Slovakia and Hungary and Moldova and Russia. They're all receiving enormous amounts of refugees and generously giving the help that they can. And we have members in Ukraine who are facing impossible choices and, and the destruction of their beautiful country. So. The church in its humanitarian arm, it, ha it keeps a two-year reserve of funding, and this allows us to be incredibly nimble. We're not going to raise funds for the, for the work that we need to do. We're using funds that have already been raised. And that allowed us to pre-position food and water several weeks ago. It allows us to be right on the border with what the people need and be responsive because the needs change every single day as the situation goes forward. But we also have a commitment. We're we're going to stay. We're not just there for the first month or the first week. We will stay until that, that situation is resolved. And it's because of what I talked about earlier. The, the disaster is only the very beginning, you know, prelude. What we really care about is helping people spiritually, emotionally, and physically recover and build their societies back. And so that's the commitment from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, and it's my life's work. I really love it. That's great. Uh, so Sharon, there's always uh, people that would might say that large institutions such as the one you represent should focus on ways really to help close to home instead of around the world. Um, that must be a challenge when you probably uh, have members with economic or social needs really everywhere. How do you address this question about local needs versus really global needs? Well, I think it's true that the best help is close to home, where the people who know the situation, who are well informed in the in the culture and one of the great helps of faith communities is they are grassroots, they are very close to home. But the barriers that we're facing of inequality, of climate change, of poverty, uh, those barriers are longstanding. And so it's going to be new cooperations that bring us the richness and the understanding that we need. And as I said before, you're going to need local and global for these complex situations, uh, but you're going to have to be clear about who plays what role. And I think that's really the secret sauce in this situation. Sharon, if you don't mind, I want to ask you one more follow-up question, and it's tangential to something you just said. Uh, so certainly a lot of young people, the younger generation that want to do humanitarian work, what would you say to them if you could just say one or two things to that younger generation about what it means to be a humanitarian? What would that be? The, the younger generation is so cause-driven, and I really love that about that. I think there's so much potential. But I'm, I'm just going to summarize what I said before. Don't think of humanitarian work as giving stuff away in foreign locations, because your greatest gift, your greatest desire is in your own community where you can do so much good if you're willing to give of yourself and of your time. So that's what I would say. And if you're looking for a great place to start, JustServe.org can link, you know, communities and people who want to volunteer with something right by them. And it's, it's easy and it's free. Sharon, that's great. Thank you so much for your words. And again, apologies for cutting you off the top of the segment. I, I try not to make a, 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 <laughs> a habit of doing that, but I did it this time. So I apologize. No problem. It was great. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sister Sharon Eubank, thank you so much. That really was and education. It's been wonderful and a really a productive conversation. I also wanted to thank uh, Keith McMullen for his role in bringing us together and introducing uh, Sister Sharon Eubank. Uh, I especially want to uh, thank you uh, for your candid and thoughtful uh, discussion about what this is called the leadership in an era of humanitarian crisis. That's the role of communities of faith. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who participated online.